Yeah, and then the folks that are Like for the first for the first slide. I think just at the end. Um, like this just, one is fine. We don't need this. I don't think right now. So I think we just want to do the like um yeah, one, one but I try to sign for a newsletter for the meeting. Okay. I wasn't sure, like, if we have some like, at the beginning, you know, like, oh, like yeah, I think we're good. Okay. Um, right, then I'll see. So, I have this. Um, I can do the first speech, and then if you want to do the second, yeah, oh, perfect. Great. No, I think Tom's at work. That This looks good. Mm -hmm. This will go ahead and get started. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Exactly. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming here tonight. Um, Berkeley Public Library is always thrilled to be hosting the Pop Science Bubble. Um, I know we have a different room than our regular space, so I hope everyone is able to find Mr. Room tonight and you know enjoy the new location. Um, just a quick land acknowledgement: uh, Berkeley Public Library acknowledges that we sit on Indigenous and unceded traditional lands of the Chochichino speaking Ohlone people. We honor with gratitude the land itself, as well as the Ohlone people who still live, work, and play in this region. Um, so welcome to Popping the Science Bubble. This is a monthly seminar series that aims to share new research findings from grad students and postdocs at UC Berkeley with the general public and create constructive discussion about a variety of science topics. We have two speakers at each seminar who will talk about their current research or a topic that they find really interesting. The organizers are four graduate students at UC Berkeley, Kaylin Zong, Daniel Bretthauer, Madison Lemer, and Oksana Andrick. Lectures happen on the third Tuesday of the month at 5.30 p.m. These programs are live streamed on the Science Global um, YouTube page, so you can view them later and share them with others. Popping the Science Bubble also has a website and a listserv that you can join to keep up to date on new Science Bubble lecture topics. All right, I'll let the team introduce tonight's speakers. Yeah, so thank you very much for being here. We're very excited to have our two speakers with us today. Um, so as Kelsey mentioned, we do this on the third Tuesday of every month, and we have researchers from a wide variety of departments to share their interesting research with you. 
And so if you are interested in learning about those future seminars, um, you can join our listserv at bit.ly slash ttsb emails, or we'll also have a QR code at the very end of the evening tonight that you can do that, and then you can sign up there. Um, we also have a website. Uh, we also have a Twitter and Facebook, and as Kelsey mentioned, the YouTube. And so uh, for tonight, we're excited to have uh, Siggy White and uh, uh, Kanika Kana. Um, with us tonight. And so this is an open format talk. And so we encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation. Um, you can submit your questions either through the chat on Zoom, if you're there, or in person, you know, please raise your hand um, and we can ask in real time. And so uh, there will also be time after each talk for more questions as well. As well. And so to start us off, uh, tonight's first speaker is going to be Sydney White. And so Sydney grew up in Western Kentucky and spent a lot of her fruit time on Kentucky Lake or camping in Land Between the Lakes, a huge natural recreational area. She received her bachelor's degree in anthropology and human biology at Indiana University, then worked in an evolutionary genetics laboratory at IU for two years before moving to Atlanta to attend graduate school at Emory University. At Emory, she received a PhD in population biology, ecology, and evolution. She is currently a postdoctoral researcher in the Integrated Biology Department at UC Berkeley. Outside of the lab, she enjoys trail running, cycling, photography, and cross-stitching. And so tonight, she'll be telling us all about how variety is the spice of life. Take it away. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Signe. Thanks for being here. Um, I hope everyone in the room can join us, maybe, but no worries if not. Um, so that was a great introduction, so I don't really need to talk too much about myself. Um, so I'm just going to dive right into my presentation. So I, ho like hopefully some of you in this room, are really interested in parasites. Um, I'm fascinated by host parasite coevolution and evolutionary dynamics. And par parasites are thought to be one of the major drivers of biodiversity evolution um, and have been estimated to comprise over 50% of all living organisms, although it's probably much higher than that. Um, and parasites have evolved these really elaborate methods to infect and transmit and to overcome both individual and population level host barriers. So one of my favorite interactions that I'll sort of get us warmed up with is one that um, when I first learned about it, it really kind of sparked my interest in studying disease evolution. And some of you might've heard of it. It's called Ophiocordyceps. Um, so this is otherwise known as the zombie ant fungus, um, but it has evolved to infect many, many hundreds of species. Um, like the weevil that's shown here, uh, that's a weevil in Ecuador. And so what happens is the weevil picks up spores from the environment and then the spores will replicate inside the weevil's body. Um, and then it, the craziest thing about it is that it essentially manipulates the weevil's behavior and the weevil will crawl up to sort of the tallest nearby object like a blade of grass or a branch and it'll latch on, it kind of has a death grip. And then once it dies, the, the fungus fruiting bodies will grow out of its body and release spores into the environment where it can then go on and infect other hosts. Um, so I think that this system is really interesting because it's both specific, but also general in that it can infect a lot of different hosts. But in the evolutionary history of this pathogen, this pathogen has had to overcome many, many host barriers. Um, and just as an FYI, I'm going to say the word parasite and pathogen probably interchangeably. So just if I, if I do, don't get confused. It's the same thing. Um, so host populations are really complicated. Uh, so it, if we think about that example with the weevil, um, not only did it have to overcome host uh, behavioral barriers, but it also had to overcome sort of complex um, host populations. So there are a lot of different types of host population complexities. Uh, the two I'm gonna focus on today are spatial structure and size. So if you think about um, a host population, say humans, uh, you know, including in this room, we're kind of clustered over here, some of us, whereas some of us are way on the other side of the room distributed. So if you think about a city, for example, you have a lot of uh, hosts in one area, really high density, really high contact rates versus sort of a rural area where you have um, more dispersed host populations. So that's kind of one aspect of host population Populations that I think about. And the other is the genetic structure. So in the same way we're all different spatially, we also have different genes. So some of us are more susceptible to some pathogens than others, some of us are more resistant. So we have um, a genetic structure that makes up our population as well. 
So what I want to talk about is how pathogens actually deal with this host complexity. And before I go too far, um, I want to introduce a couple of terms that disease biologists use. You've probably heard these terms before, but I just want to define them for what I mean. Um, so when, when you hear the word virulence, what I mean by that is a pathogen's ability to cause harm to a host. So that could be to kill the host as well, but we're just going to call it ho host harm. And then transmission is a pathogen's ability to transmit to a new host. And so when you think about transmission and virulence, typically these two things are very tightly coupled in a particular host parasite interaction. And an easy way to think about this, I think, is if you think about an infinite host population where you have tons and tons of hosts, um, a pathogen can transmit, it can get into the host cells, it can create a bunch of itself, it replicates, and then it bursts out of the host and it goes on to infect the next host. It doesn't really have to worry about causing the host too much harm because it has so many other hosts it can transfer to. Um, and so one, another way of putting this is a quote that I found that I really like. Um, Oh, that thing's kind of annoying. Um, so Dana Hawley is a disease biologist at Virginia Tech, and she says, in other words, it's not that pathogens are truly evil or bent on destruction of their hosts. Any harm that a pathogen does to its host is basically a byproduct of the need to transmit. So again, this is sort of theoretical space, um, but we know that this isn't not approximating reality. Um, so the best way to think about the graph is through another quote that I really like. So um, Think about this as um, if, so this, this person, Andre Daunt at Cornell University says, if I'm a bacterium, what do I need in order to be successful? If I become too virulent and kill my host before I transmit, um, which is up here, then that's not good. But if I don't make my host sufficiently sick and have low virulence, I won't be transmitted. And that's not good either. And so in reality, we have what's known as a virulence transmission trade-off, where we have an optimal level of virulence, and it all depends on the particulars of the host parasite system we're talking about, right? But what we saw earlier with this exponential, or I guess linear growth, um, this positive correlation between virulence and transmission, in reality, again, it's not always that simple, because hosts are not infinite. So... Thinking back um, on the first two things I talked about, so we have host spatial structure and we have host genetic structure. So today I want to talk about two different stories that sort of exemplify both of those different um, host complexities and how that influences virulence evolution. So the first story I want to talk about deals with spatial structure. I should move that, shouldn't I? That's really not okay. Um, okay, do we have any birders in the room? And if so, does anyone know what this bird is? Pause for water break. No, I don't think we're finished. Oh. No, it's not. They do exist here. They're very common. This is a house finch. So it is a finch. So you're close. Um, and I'll get it. I'll, I'll get into the history of the house finch in a minute. But um, house finches all around the United States have had this pathogen that's infected them for many years. And it was first seen at bird feeders in Washington, D.C. And so you can tell here that we have a healthy bird um, and an infected bird. So there's a pathogen that actually infects the bird's eye and it's, it gives you a conjunctivitis. So it's, it's essentially a pink eye for birds. And it's caused by this um, mycoplasma galliceptacum, which is a bacterial pathogen that was originally found in poultry farms. And so at some point it made the species jump from chickens or other types of poultry to house finches. And it causes, like I said, this mycoplasmal conjunctivitis. So I'm gonna take a step back and talk a little bit about the historical range of house finches, and this is relevant. So originally house finches in my crude drawing um, were sort of native to the Southwest and to Mexico. Um, and early in the 1900s, people from California, particularly Los Angeles, decided to capture a bunch of these birds and sell them to New Yorkers. Um, and so <laughs> there was a law that was passed um, in the early 1900s called the Migratory Bird Treaty. And that essentially meant that you couldn't sell, you couldn't capture, sell, um, or have any sort of uh, birds that are migratorily important, uh, which house finches are. So around that time, to avoid prosecution, a lot of people who had these as pets let them go into the wilderness, into the city, um, and all the vendors who had them also let them go. So most of these birds died, but a lot of them survived. Um, and so now, 
This is the current range of house finches. So they've established two major populations, one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast. Here, it looks like there aren't really many in the Great Plains. There are, they're just very um, sparse. There are not very many of them, but they do exist there. So as I mentioned, in 1994, disease was first seen um, at a bird feeder in Washington, DC. And then from about 1994 to 2008, it spread all throughout the Eastern Seaboard. And it was really, really virulent. And so about half of all house finches died on the East Coast. Kind of subsequently slash simultaneously, there was a Western epidemic of the exact same um, pathogen, also really virulent, also killed a lot of birds. So the interesting thing here, um, and just a note about sort of disease severity in these birds. So if we look down at the bottom one first, if, you, if a bird is really infected with this pathogen, it can't travel very far because it's too sick, but it can infect a lot of other birds. So that's important. Um, if it has low severity, it can travel far, it can migrate, but it can't infect many other birds. So as you can imagine, as the population of birds um, that were infected with this pathogen slowly started to, to die and the pathogen spread, and it was really high in the east, as it made itself westward and got into sort of the Great Plains states, the virulence actually decreases. And we see this, there was a bunch of sampling done over many decades, and we see that all of the isolates that have been taken from the Great Plains birds are actually much lower in viral or in, in pathogen than on um, the East Coast. And then the subsequent epidemic on the West Coast, again, once you get into those sort of tightly clustered dense populations again, the pathogen took off. So I think this is a really cool example, um, sort of a real time evolution um, example of spatial structure being really important when we think about host virulence um, and that trade-off. So, and just as a, if anyone's interested, if you want to help citizen science wise, you can go to theaterwatch.org. This is a website from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and they do a lot of citizen science where if you're sitting outside and you're watching your birds, you can track how many come and what species and if any of them are infected. So this is how um, a lot of that data was collected on the East and West coasts. Um, so this is a really great citizen science project. Okay, so that was sort of the first story with spatial structure. Now I'm moving on to the second, which is the genetic structure. Does anyone recognize this drawing or have an idea about where it came from? And you can just guess. I mean, I'll tell you the answer. Like, a what? What did you say? I was thinking how it looked a little bit like Oliver Twist. Okay, interesting. Um, so this is act. Maybe this will help. This is an engraving called Skibberine by James Mahoney in 1847. Does that narrow it down at all? It's okay if not. <laughs> maybe this helps. So this was a famous painting from the Irish potato famine. Um, this Irish lumper is a variety of potato that's clonal. It originally came from the Americas, and which is really interesting to me. Um, and it was really successful in Ireland because it can grow in these sort of um, rocky soils. It can grow a lot of places that it, you wouldn't think it could grow. And so it became really important uh, for food for a lot of Irish people. And um, over time, it became infected with this pathogen, um, and it's called Phytophthora infestans, and it's a sort of a fungal spore mold, which causes blight. You might have heard of blight in other um, plants. Um, it's infected by mold. And so this crop was so important to people that it caused death by starvation in one out of every eight people over three years in the 1840s. So about a hundred, uh, one million people died and a million people fled the country. And then um, overall, there was about a 20 to 25% decline in Ireland's population. So this had huge uh, problems um, or huge ramifications for Ireland. And why was this pathogen so successful? I've already kind of given you the answer. So we'll take a, a closer look at it. So again, this Irish lumper was clonal. So there was essentially no genetic diversity in all of the potatoes grown in Ireland. And the interesting thing too about this Phytophthora infestans, um, and here you can see a scanning electron microscope of how it kind of 
uh, grows its way down into the skin of the potato and it basically turns it into a, like a mush you can't eat. Um, but the interesting thing is the spores are super, super environmentally hardy. So they don't need necessarily a host to host contact in order to spread. They can be washed by rain from, so it usually starts on the leaves and the rain can wash it down into the soil and then it can start infecting the tubers. And then um, the other thing is that it can be carried by wind also. So it can travel really far. And so if you have this monoculture that can have a persistent pathogen living outside of it, that's kind of a recipe for disaster. And that's exactly what happened. So there was a really interesting experiment done um, in 2003. And essentially this person decided to um, grow a bunch of these Irish lumber potatoes in a monoculture and then also had a polyculture of the Irish lumber potatoes that had some levels of resistance. So it was a mixed, same species, but like a mixture of different genotypes. Some of them, some of those genotypes had resistance to the pathogen. And they found in a very experimentally nice way um, that in the polyculture, there was about a 50% reduction in disease prevalence. So that kind of confirms in some capacity that monocultures actually sort of promoted uh, this rapid evolution of this pathogen to sort of specialize on the host. And I was Googling around and I, I had no idea we had an evolution website at Berkeley, um, but we do. So if you wanna learn more about this, <laughs> I encourage you to look this up, but I thought that th this was a pretty nice little graphic of essentially what I just talked about. So um, the original crop, you have a bunch of diverse potatoes, say diverse genotypes, um, the blight hits, the pathogen is spread, and then some of them die. And then you're left with those that are a little bit more resistant. Yeah. Just based on this picture, it looks like only a certain type of potato is in the way. But can the polyculture also protect potatoes that might otherwise be susceptible to infection? It's a good question. So in the long, so this experiment was not done sort of on an evolutionary scale. And I think what you're talking about is in the long run, potentially, yes, they could, but just sort of a, in a one-time point, like, does it actually reduce disease prevalence? No, I don't think it would, but eventually it's possible. And that's a good question. So yeah, this is a little bit, um, it's a little, yeah, don't think too deeply about this. <laughs> um, but good question. And then, yeah, and the other example, of course, you have cloned potatoes, all the same genotype, blight comes, everything's wiped out, and you're left with nothing, hence starvation. Okay, so I've kind of left you with these two stories about spatial structure and genetic structure. But of course, in reality, uh, both of these things are prevalent in any host population, right? You don't separate things out by, by space and genes. Um, so there are clusters of, po of populations of hosts that have different you know, genetic backgrounds. Um, and so this is kind of where my work comes in, is looking at the intersection of space and genetic heterogeneity. And how I do that, um, like Daniel said, I'm a postdoc in the integrative biology department. And the host species that I work with is called Plodia interpunctella. You may have seen it in your pantry at some point, hopefully not, but this infects a lot of, or infests a lot of rice and grain and oatmeal and things like that. Um, so it's a major agricultural pest, mostly for stored, stored grain products. Um, so there you can see an adult and then a larva on the side that's kind of the same color as what it's eating. And there's a species specific virus that infects it called Plodia interpunctella granulosis virus. And the nice thing about this virus for us is that we can do a lot of very easy sort of experimental manipulations in the lab. Um, and we can see that once we infect the larvae, um, they kind of turn this like milky white color. So it's really easy for us to tell what, who's infected and who's not. So as I said, my research question is sort of how does the virus evolve in a host population that is both spatially complex and genetically diverse? And more importantly, how will I do these experiments? And I should say that the, the nice thing about uh, doing lab work like this is that you can really isolate the variables of interest. The two experiments I talked about before weren't really experiments, right? They were sort of historical observations, um, whereas this is really directed evolution. And that's what I do as an experimental biologist. So, um, just to give you a brief background of how we do this in the lab, so we have these sort of plastic containers that we have all of the larvae in. Um, so the larvae are the ones, aka caterpillars, 
I call them larvae. Um, the larvae are in the food. They're the ones that get infected. You can't have, adults don't get infected. So it is a, a life stage specific virus. And we can either kind of, um, we can change the spatial structure, right? From spatially segregated. So thinking about sort of those dense clusters of populations to spatially integrated, uh, which is kind of more spread out. And the way we do this is really kind of simple. So most of their food is comprised of oatmeal. Like I said, that's how they are infected. And the way that we change the viscosity of the food is just adding glycerol. So glycerol makes it much stickier and more viscous. And so it's a lot harder for them to sort of crawl and eat through. And we've actually published a pretty high profile paper on this, uh, just using this kind of simple um, system. And we did find that once you infect, so we have the spatially segregated and spatially integrated, if you infect each of these with virus, we find that the local interactions actually select for lower pathogen infectivity, meaning in a place where you have really high density but a limited number of hosts, it really behooves you as a pathogen to not burn out all of your hosts really quickly. Uh, whereas in the sort of larger scale um, host mixing sort of globally situation, that selects for increased pathogen virulence. So we found that to be really interesting. Um, and where my work comes in is now we have, so all of these are sort of genetically identical hosts, and we're also interested in genetically different hosts. So we have a whole bunch of different uh, genotypes in the lab of, of Plodia intercomptella. Some have high resistance to the virus and some have low resistance to the virus. So my experiments will kind of be this intersection of spatially, spatial structure and genetic structure. Um, this work is in the process right now, so I don't have results for you, but I do have a few predictions. So as I had mentioned before, um, generally when you have lower genetic diversity, you have a high uh, virulence overall. And then when you have a high spatial integration, so you have sort of, you're able to really easily move throughout the food and come in contact with other hosts, also you have high virulence. So my prediction is that in the situation where we have um, exactly what I said, uh, low genetic diversity and high spatial integration, we should see the most virulent, virulent pathogens emerge. And then the opposite, um, sort of the, the lowest virulence should be seen in these situations where we have um, sp spatial segregation and a diversity of host genotypes. Um, but stay tuned for that work because it will be coming out <laughs> in the next, who knows, couple of years. Um, so that's all, kind of all I have for you today. And I hope that was somewhat of an interesting story. And I just want to acknowledge my lab um, and we work on a bunch of different things. I'm the only person actually working on the MOP system right now, but we have people working on bees and doing math modeling and a bunch of stuff. Um, and I will take any questions that you have. Yeah, please, any questions? I kind of missed the beginning of the talk or the virulence mm -hmm. is like it's kill it faster or basically yeah it's virulence is just a proxy of host harm so it could be mortality or it could be morbidity you know just being sick um yeah that's how exactly how we define it mm -hmm. yeah hey, um I have a question can you go to the slide that you proved the transmissibility of virulence yeah Virulence transmission trade off. And I wonder, so there's, I mean, there are also uh, symbiotic relationships, which are, you know, parasitic. But I, is there, a, is there like a similar relationship or trade off between, so you know, it's like, is there any benefits from a symbiotic relationship where you can talk to these similar conditions about those sorts of interactions? So you're saying, Trans maybe trans instead of virulence transmission and benefit. Yeah, probably. Okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, in this case, as long so we're assuming here the transmission is is negative for the host, right? Because the way that it infects the next host is that it like has to use host resources, and by using host resources, host that is bad, right? Um, but if you had a beneficial interaction, then, th so these things would be decoupled, I guess, but 
yeah, transmission could increase, I guess, for um, a bacteria that provides some benefit to an extent, right? Because if both, both parties mutually benefit, there still has to be some cap on, for example, a bacteria that's beneficial because otherwise you are just overrun with bacteria, right? So there, there are still sort of biological caps on things, but like theoretically, yeah, I have to think about that more. Yeah. Um, what, and maybe we've talked about this before, what are the different genotypes of your moths? And do you think that there's like the, if variety is the only thing or if the, you know, the actual type of um, like function associated with the genotype is gonna help them do better? So yeah, um, let me think about putting this in layman's terms. Um, there are a lot, there's a lot of work done on trade-offs. So we talked about trade-offs with virulence and transmission. But there are also trade-offs with life history traits. So sometimes, and we found in, in the Plodia system that individual genotypes with high resistance to a pathogen typically have some cost to, there's some cost to growth or reproduction, right? So there is some trade-off where in the absence of the pathogen, it's actually worse to be more resistant. Um, so in terms of like what the genotypes are, resistance is a really complicated trait, right? That's, there's no sort of one gene that we know of that's, that's sort of accounting for all resistance. So it's really quantitative, meaning it has a lot of different genes across the genome that's contributing to resistance. But it seems like the important ones tend to be linked to um, development traits, like pupil weight, for example, or larval weight. Um, so, so that type of thing is, is really interesting. And part of this work that's never been done before that we're planning to do is actually to sequence all of these inbred lines and see what's actually going on on the genetic level. So I'm really excited about that and I'll let you know. Organizer privilege to also Absolutely. ask a question. Absolutely. Um, so I'm kind of curious. So you talked about like the, the Irish potato was a clone yeah. of all of them. And that seems really bad yeah. for, for the species. So like, do you know why the species might do that? Or is that purely like a human thing? Oh, it's a human is, thing. Okay. It's totally a human thing. Yeah, I think human, I mean, agriculture is generally a human thing. I, all the ant fungus people are yelling at me, but um generally humans, you know, that's, we've had this problem again and again and again in sort of modern agriculture with certain crops being grown in mass, basically, and just a disease coming in and being able to wipe things out. And even now, I mean, it gets really complicated with like genetic modification, but we have a lot of crops that we grow that are essentially genetically identical, but they have been bred or um, genetically modified to, you know, prevent some pathogen from getting to them or prevent, you know, be, be better at being uh, tolerant to drought or whatever. Um, so, I mean, in general, clones, the reason clones exist in the world is because people, not people, clones are trying to sort of reproduce as quickly as possible and get their genetic material into the next generation as possible. So there is a, a benefit to being a clone, but if you have any sort of environmental shift or change, which happens all the time, like a pathogen being introduced, it's just gonna wipe you out. So it's not always the best strategy. Yeah. So this kind of plot, uh, for, for this example, this one, the infinite host population and the reality. Yeah. Actually, reality is just the ones like we could observe because um, they happen to be existing long enough time and happen to be there to observe. Yeah. Actually, virus should, can have like all kinds of spectrums. Even this high transmission, high uh, virulence can could happen. Yeah. Uh, could could, could, ha could even be more uh, possible, but it just die out, and we never get the opportunity to observe yes. it in a way, right? Yes, absolutely. So I think an important thing to think about when we think about graphs like this is this time scale, right? Because exactly like you said, if we're just looking in reality, if we just are zooming out and looking at this area right here, it looks a lot like that, right? 
um, but we have to think about the entire time scale. Um, and so zooming in, you might see a completely different thing than if you zoom out a whole lot, if that makes sense. I think that's kind of what you're trying to say, right? In a way, like what I'm saying, like actually that could be, we, we don't know what, what kind of virus combination is the most possible existing in the, in, in the nature. Mm -hmm. Um, but we can only observe or capture those yeah. ones we observe. Yeah. And the, those ones happen to be, we can observe actually is the one maybe more like the, the reality curve because they can transmit and they are not killing the host yeah. off and we, we observe them. Absolutely. But it could be in some remote corner, this, there are a lot more the very transmissible ones and very virulent ones. Yeah. They they already kill them all, all of and they die out too in a way. Yeah. So and we we'll never be able to capture the whole Absolutely. spectrum of them. And that's what math is for, right? Math is in doing math modeling is for being able to figure out what those observations or what what those situations would look like in theoretical space when we can't always observe them from the human eye. Let's see one more round of applause. I'm targeting our next speaker, Sarah. And thank you, everyone, for being so understanding about team karaoke night. That's what that is. Oh my gosh. Yes. Um, I guess I can buy this one, right? Yeah, you should be. Um, I think share just because I think it's easier to. Well, um, I would like to thank Vicky for uh, the amazing talk, and while Kanika sets up, I'm going to introduce her. Um, Kanika Khanna grew up in India, where she did her bachelor's and master's in biomechanical engineering and biotechnology. Following that, she did her PhD at UCSD in biology. She is currently a postdoc at UC Berkeley. She studies post-microbe interactions using high-resolution imaging technologies like cryo-electron tomography. Outside of research, Kanika loves to hike and do yoga. She's also an like, avid crocheter, and her first project is yeah, making a life-size crochet portrait of Indian women scientists. It's uh, really cool. So, yeah, it's going to the left. You need to go all the way over. Do you want the mirror or do you want it to? Uh, I can mirror, but I don't know how I can measure with. This line is going wrong. Can you see? I can't see. Yeah, the mouth. Oh, okay. There we go. Additionally, on the subject of science and disease, um, we are hosting a library program oh, next, next Tuesday on the 25th um, at um, 6 o'clock. Um, it's a gardening program. It's called What's Wrong with this Plant? So I'm sure you can come up. Um, and so it's happening in the community room next Tuesday at 6 p.m. What yeah. things are wrong with the plant? Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's a good thing to explain. And what do we have to do? Like, it's 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 like, uh, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you. Uh, and I'm excited to talk to you about some of the work that um, uh, actually I'm using these high resolution imaging techniques. And I'll talk a little bit more about it uh, using prior electron tomography to study uh, host microbe interactions. Uh, um, and I did my PhD in UCSD and I'm currently doing my postdoc at UC Berkeley here. Uh, and um, you know, the way I'm gonna talk about it is like, I'm using the same kind of imaging techniques as I did in my PhD, but for different host microbe interactions. But maybe I'll give a little bit uh, of a back, uh, uh, the biological question that I uh, tried to solve um, during my PhD actually, um, in which case the host is the bacteria and uh, the pathogen is uh, viruses which are in bacteria. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that today. Um, okay, so why am I interested in bacteria, studying bacteria? Uh, so 
like if you look at these two, you know, different cell types, like a typical eukaryotic cell, like a human cell versus a bacterial cell. So the traditional view is that bacterial cells are like sacks of enzymes uh, versus a eukaryotic cell is a very organized factory where you have different organelles, which have different functions, a uh, very specialized function. So you uh, probably know about the mitochondria, which is like the energy currency of the cell, uh, or uh, if there is, uh, you know, like some waste in the cell, which has to be disposed of, there's like a separate organelle for the lysosome, which is involved in it. So all the functions are segregated uh, inside uh, a eukaryotic cell. And one of the distinguishing factors between a eukaryote uh, and a bacterial cell is like the nucleus. The so nucleus is like the defining feature. So uh, all of us, you know, we have in our cells, we have like a defined nucleus, which holds all of our DNA inside. And it separates like the DNA from all the proteins which are present outside of this uh, nucleus boundary versus in bacteria, uh, there isn't a concept of a nucleus uh, per se. All of the DNA is like just spread around. So you can see like uh, in here, basically these bacteria are just like, uh, sort of like burritos, uh, if uh, you can think of it, something like that. So you have the DNA, which is spread all around um, uh, the cell. And then there are these proteins which are floating around and uh, in this uh, liquid, like a, like a soup, like structure called a cytoplasm. And then it has this envelope just around the bacteria to separate it from the rest of the environment. And these are some of the early images um, using like transmission electron microscopy of the bacteria in which they would prepare like thin sections and then see them under this um, uh, microscope and you know like based on that these observations that a bacterial cell is typically a sac enzymes versus um, what I think is that we don't have the right tools to be able to look at them and say whether these are just like sacs of enzymes or there is some sort of a higher level organization uh, in the bacteria um, which we are not able to see with the current uh, microscopy methods um, mm -hmm. and you know, just uh, talking a little bit about, you know, like sizes, because that will matter a lot for this purpose of this talk, is that, um, you know, like, um, the humans are in the order of meters, and we have, like, uh, uh, imaging tools to study our in, in our bodies, like a PET scan or a CT scan, uh, to study, you know, different organelles, but like, as we go down the scale, you know, as we're talking about like bacteria, which are falling in the range of one micron, and if you compare it to the width of a human hair, which is like 100 microns, so we're talking uh, 100 times smaller than the size of your hair, and uh, the current microscopy techniques, uh, you know, like, uh, may not be enough to see the details which are inside of the bacteria at a very high resolution, so uh, if you have ever looked at pond water, you might see like some squiggly creatures, which are in, uh, you know, like floating and everything, so there's maybe bacteria or unicellular organ or eukaryotes, but you really don't know what's like inside of these squiggly things at that resolution. Um, and um, we can try to study a little bit, uh, you know, like uh, using some of the light microscopy techniques, but I'm going to talk about these techniques which fall in this particular range here. Uh, uh, which is like the cryolectron tomography range of it. And that allows us to study like things at a resolution of just a few nanometers. And at that few nanometer scale, you can really see like where the different proteins are, how they're interacting with other proteins uh, in the surrounding environment. So uh, sort of providing a more holistic view of a cell uh, at a very high resolution that was not uh, you know, uh, possible before. Um, so just you know a little bit uh, why these current microscopy methods limit uh, our ability to study bacterial cell biology so to say so if you look at this bacteria so i'm indicating like a size which is roughly one micron or you can think of it as like 100 times less than the size of hair or so and so we have some of these fluorescence microscopy tools and the idea is like if you want to see uh, like a protein which is inside the bacteria so you can fuse that protein with like a fluorescent molecule, like so, and most of the time these fluorescent molecules are like from GFP or like the jellyfish. And those uh, molecules will then glow up inside a fluorescent uh, microscope. Uh, but here you see like what in this picture, the, uh, you know, um, the authors have um, uh, tagged one of the proteins which make uh, a, a protein which is involved in making ribosomes. And ribosomes are involved in making more proteins inside the bacterial cell. So they have tagged that with a fluorescent molecule. But you, what you all see is basically like all of the bacteria sort of lit up. Uh, and you can use a kind of microscopy technique called super resolution microscopy. And, you know, you can start, uh, uh, which sort of improves the resolution a little bit. So now you see it's not like all a blur, but there are these individual dots around the bacteria that you can see. Um, um, but the resolution is still very much limited. And what I, uh, you know, worked uh, during uh, my PhD and now during my postdoc is this technique called 
electron electron tomography. And uh, what this technique really allows us to sort of zoom inside the cell and be able to look at these individual molecules, which are like three to five nanometer, like really, really tiny, and how they're interacting with their environment in a native context in the context of the bacteria itself. So what is this cryo-electron tomography, uh, which I've been talking about, or cryo-ET for short, as I may refer to it at some point of time. So this is a technique to visualize molecular structures inside the cell. And um, as the word cryo suggests, so I'm going to show this video to you, like how this technique is implemented in the lab. Uh, now, as the word cryo suggests, uh, basically, at this point, uh, you know, we freeze the samples uh, very rapidly uh, at temperatures of liquid nitrogen, like minus 180 or so. And when we're freezing the samples very rapidly at liquid nitrogen temperatures, uh, the sample uh, is preserved in its biological context. So everything uh, stays as it were in real time. Mm -hmm. um, so let's look at this video. So you see these uh, molecules. So these are like virus particles. Uh, which have been frozen at liquid nitrogen temperatures, like minus 180. And then we put them uh, on a, a grid, it's sort of an electron microscopy grid. And then we take this grid inside a transmission electron microscope. And what we're doing is that we are taking projection images uh, of our specimen at different tilt. So if you've ever gotten like a CAT scan or a CT scan, uh, you know, like maybe of your hand or something that in that case, uh, basically it is the beam which is being rotated and it is taking images of your hand from different angles. But this is uh, the case where your sample is being rotated and the electron beam stays constant. And then you're reconstructing. So you have all these 2D projection images. Then you can combine all these projection images mathematically and uh, get what your sample looks like in three dimension. So in this case, this is like a herpes virus particle. Um, and you can uh, sort of see the three dimensional reconstruction. And then using this, uh, you know, when we have these 3D images or what are called tomograms, so you see these slices because it's in 3D. So you see these slices which are going up and down and you can start segmenting what's inside of your uh, sample. So in this case, in the virus particle, you can segment like the proteins in the envelope or the spike proteins of SARS-CoV-2, which has also been done. So you can start getting all this information at a very high resolution sort of structural level detail. Uh, which can also allow you to, you know, like make drugs against particular uh, uh, epitopes of the viruses or particular uh, target regions inside uh, your molecule of interest uh, in this case. So, um, but one of the limitations of this technique is that it only works on very thin specimens. Uh, and bacteria, uh, uh, although they're very small, they're still considered on the higher end. Uh, to be able to use these, uh, 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 you know, technique to get high resolution structure. Um, so what we do is we also, so we can make these cellular samples thin by using a technique called cryo-focused ion beam milling. Uh, and this is a technique which has been used by material scientists, uh, you know, for a very long time to make like these silicon chips and wafers. And we've adopted the instruments at cryo temperatures so that we can also use it for biological specimens. Um, and what you see on this image is that basically what you see something like a fried egg, this is actually a mammalian cell so something which has been extracted like you know from the human skin or whatever, and this a mammalian cell is like uh, kept on the grid like an electron microscopy holder or something, and in so this cryo focused ion beam milling instrument it's like it has two beams. So from the top is like the SEM beam, which is the scanning electron microscope beam. So that basically, if you have seen pictures of bed bugs and everything in the magazine, so it's, it's telling you like how your sample is, when, where your sample is. And then you have a focused ion beam at a certain angle. And uh, uh, using that, uh, you know, focused ion beam, so it basically has a, a stream of uh, positively charged gallium ions, and these gallium ions are very heavy. So you can imagine, like, if you're constantly hitting something with these very heavy atoms, they're going to ablate that particular part of the specimen. So let me show you a quick movie as to how the focused ion beam milling uh, instrument works. So again, you see this mammalian egg, which is put on this uh, fried egg kind of a structure. And now what you see in this video is that, uh, you know, like you can make like patterns. So these uh, uh, patterns, uh, the gallium ion will basically then come in these patterns and then it will ablate the cellular material from the top and the bottom. And then you are left with this thin slice. And these thin slices are in the range, which can be imaged at a very high resolution using a uh, cryo-electron tomography technique. So just imagining like you have a bread and a cheese, you're taking out the bread and you're left with this thin slice of cheese that you can image inside. Um, a transmission electron microscopy instrument. So just to summarize, we can do this technique for our bacterial cells. And the way we do it, we like rapidly freeze our bacterial specimens. 
um, uh, in this sort of a layer of ice, basically, which was which preserves the native context of you know the bacteria. Uh, so what you see, these rod shaped things are like bacteria. And then we can do like milling so that we can make these thin slices of the bacterial specimens and then see them uh, inside a transmission electron microscope, take different projection images at different angles, and then reconstruct to get sort of a three-dimensional view of how our sample looks like and um, at a very high resolution. So this is basically an image of a, uh, this this is a million dollar instrument, like a $5 million instrument, which is at UC Berkeley uh, in, in the basement. Um, so you can see this is a very big instrument. Uh, um, and the sample is like three millimeter, very, very tiny. And this can provide like almost sort of a magnification of uh, unprecedented insight into the biological specimen. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, bacteriophages, basically, um, and this was a work which I did in my PhD. So these bacteriophages are also bacteria eaters. So basically, these are viruses of bacteria, um, and um, uh, so you can see like how the viruses of the bacteria look like. So you have like this little head at the top, which is uh, the capsid, uh, which is called the capsid, and it's a nicosahedral. Most of the time, it's a nicosahedral shape, and uh, you know like. Uh, now we are all very familiar with the SARS-CoV-2 and different kinds of viruses which infect uh, mammalians, basically so humans and other animals like us, but these viruses only infect bacteria. And, um, uh, you know, the difference between the eukaryotic viruses and these bacteriophage or phage, uh, one of the differences is that they have these tails and these tail fibers which help them attach to the bacteria uh, they want to infect. Uh, and one of the uh, other things about these phages are that they're very specific for the kind of bacteria they can infect. So even if, you know, like you have two bacterial species which are of the same kind, but if they're different strains, so they have some genetic differences, uh, it's possible that the phage might not uh, infect both of them, like if it is specific for only one kind of bacteria. So why um, do we care about these phages? Why do we care about these uh, uh, phage which uh, infect bacteria? So recently, uh, there has been a surge of studies which have shown that these phages can be very useful for treating uh, uh, bacterial infections which are resistant to all different kinds of drugs. So all of us are um, uh, maybe hearing about antimicrobial resistant bacteria or superbugs uh, which are uh, coming in and you know like they're resistant to different kinds of antibiotics and you know one has and um, uh, it, it, they can be recurrent infections, something which may not be treated with uh, a single course or multiple courses of antibiotics. So uh, phages are coming as a very promising technique uh, recently to treat these antibacterial infections. And what you see in this image, actually, this was one of the uh, first um, few studies uh, which, which came uh, a few years ago. Um, uh, it was uh, basically performed uh, on a teenage girl uh, who was almost, um, you know, she she did not have any chances of survival. She had cystic fibrosis and chronic lung diseases, and uh, she uh, got uh, a mycobacterium abscess infection, and it's, it's a very serious infection, and there weren't any chances of survival, and it was sort of an experimental therapy because at that time, phages were not approved to be uh, used on patients. So it was kind of an experimental, like, last resort, tech, uh, you know, uh, to treat this particular patient. Um, uh, and also, this was the first therapeutic use of phages to treat a mycobacterium infection in particular. And what you can see in this image is that just before treatment, she had these lesions in pink, which are shown here, and uh, she was given um, bacteriophages. And uh, it was just like a swab on the skin, so very, very easy, like a topical application and everything. And uh, after a few courses of treatment, she was fine, and she's still fine. Uh, and this was sort of a miracle, basically, at that time, because, um, and, but the thing is, these phage therapy is not new. There are um, the, you know, the first use of sort of phage therapy for uh, human patients actually started in Russia. So a lot of European countries, especially in uh, Russia, they have been using these bacteriophages to uh, treat, uh, especially the wounds of soldiers um, in during the World War II. And, uh, uh, in here, these are some of the documents uh, that you can see, like uh, the initial uses of phages to treat bacteria, but um, clinical trials are still very difficult because, as I mentioned, these phages are very specific. 
So if, you know, even if a, a person has a mycobacterium infection, but they might be just different strains of bacteria, so one phage might not work on all of them. So um, that's where the clinical trials are still very limited, but it's getting more and more sort of exploited phages to treat antimicrobial drug resistant on a one case by case basis, so to say. So I worked on this particular class of phages, which are called jumbo phages. And these are called jumbo phages because they're very larger compared to traditional uh, phages that we have been studying. So they were only discovered very recently, I would say like seven to eight years ago, uh, versus these other phages, which um, uh, have been there for a very long time, which are called like T4 phage, which is one of the most common phage that is uh, around. And for just for size purposes, this is the ribosome, which is like a, uh, the, uh, the machinery that makes proteins inside our cells. So uh, I worked on these jumbo phages, these very large phages. And um, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, a lot of this work was performed at UCSD with a lot of different collaborations. So uh, I'm just going to mention the labs that I was involved with um, at UCSD, especially Elizabeth Villa and Joe Bogliano. And um, so we started doing tomography of uh, these jumbo phages, which were infecting bacterial cells. And I'm going to show you like one tomogram. And we're going to go through this movie. And what you'll see are basically, again, you go through different slices and then explain like when this jumbophage infects the bacteria, how does the bacterial cell looks like and what we have learned about the infection process or the life cycle of jumbophage in the bacteria per se. So in this movie, what you see is basically, you see this bacteria which has been infected with the jumbophage. And this uh, here is, maybe I'll just stand up. So this in this pinkish color, what you see is like this membrane of the bacteria, which is, um, and what was the most important discovery was that, as I mentioned, bacteria don't have nucleus. But when jumbophages infect bacteria, what they do is that they enclose all of their DNA inside uh, of the bacteria. So to protect them from any kind of bacterial defense machinery that may be there. And what you see in this green are the different capsids uh, and, uh, <coughs> So you can see some of the capsids which are empty here, but what happens is that these capsids come and they dock on the shell, uh, which has the phage DNA, and they start getting filled up, you know, with the different DNA, uh, with the DNA of the phage, and then they get fully uh, uh, enclosed with the phage DNA, and then they move into the cytoplasm, and some of them you can see they have these tails assembling independently in the cytoplasm, and these capsids dock on the uh, tail to form, uh, you know, the complete sort of the virulent life cycle of these phages. Um, so, um, yes, yeah, so this is again this image where you can see this bacterial cell and when the jumbophage infects the bacteria, so normally you wouldn't find a bacteria with this like shell like structure, so it would just be um, basically sort of an amalgamation, as I said, like a burrito of different protein structures there, but when the jumbophages infect, it forms this nucleus like structure where you have the phage DNA, and what you see these yellow things and popcorns are the bacterial ribosomes, uh, which are separated from the nucleus. So the ribosomes are away from the nucleus in this case. And uh, why do we think this is the nucleus? So as I mentioned, one of the defining features of the eukaryotic cell, which separates it from the bacterial cell is that a eukaryotic cell has a nucleus versus our cells don't have a nucleus. And what the nucleus does uh, in the eukaryotic cell is that it basically separates the proteins which are involved in uh, the processes of DNA replication and DNA transcription from making proteins. So all the DNA, uh, you know, the duplication of the DNA, the conversion of uh, mRNA, uh, the DNA to mRNA happens inside the eukaryotic nucleus. And we saw similar events which were happening in jumbophage. So we basically again tagged all the jumbophage protein with um, you know, the GFP or the fluorescent protein that I'm, uh, I was telling. And then we imaged them using a fluorescent microscope. And what we saw, as you can see here, so this protein, which is called RecA, it is basically involved in duplication of DNA. And you can see this is present inside the nucleus-like structure versus proteins which are involved in translation. So proteins which convert mRNA to protein, uh, like for instance, uh, here you see L20 protein on the third panel that is present outside this nucleus. So there's a very organized structure which is happening when these jumbophage infect the nucleus. And, you know, then we also started imaging like different uh, time points at different time points and different life cycles. And one of the other things that we saw is like just before bursting at the final stages, what happened is that these phages, they form like a bouquet kind of a structure inside the cell. 
uh, and we think like this bouquet kind of structure is basically helping um, sort of um, making the process of lysing the cell more efficient by having all of the phages together and then it bursts out of the scale. So this happens at really, really late time points. And uh, now we have also been able to get, you know, like from these images to what is the structure of this nucleus-like structure, uh, this nucleus-like shell. So I'm, I'm not going to talk a lot about it, but, you know, the idea basically is that, so you have the segmentation in sort of uh, this blue purple color of the nucleus, the jumbophage nucleus. What we can do is that we can take this uh, segmentation and we can start, you know, using the high risk, uh, uh, very, um, uh, computational techniques, very intensive computational techniques, we can start seeing what the structure of this whole nucleus like thing is at a very high resolution. And what we found was that this um, thing basically, um, this, this nucleus like shell, it forms like a closed compartment, which is made of one single layer of protein. So, um, and this uh, singular layer of protein, it forms the mesh around the phage DNA. And uh, this is, um, you know, one of the interesting thing is like it's a square mesh. So there are these four of these proteins which are coming together versus in biology, most of the things are sort of a, in a hexagonal symmetry or a, a six-fold symmetry. Like if you have seen the honey, honeycomb structures, which have been very efficient packaging uh, versus the jumbo phage, they like to form the square lattice kind of a structure. And the idea we think is that the honeycomb lattice is very efficient packing. So it's very tight packing, so to say versus this phage uh, uh, shell, basically the nucleus shell, it has to continuously grow because as the phage is infecting the bacteria, uh, uh, you know, like it, it, the shell grows over time. Um, and we think that this um, square lattice sort of helps uh, uh, in the growth of the shell. So it's not completely very tight, but it's sort of growing uh, over time. So I'm just gonna uh, show this quick movie of this whole infection process. Uh, which uh, uh, Janet Devasa uh, at University of Utah, she's a professor who really, you know, can convert biological processes into very interesting animations and pictures. Uh, she made for a lab uh, uh, to show how this jumbophage uh, infection happens. Um, so you see this bacteria and this fire, you know, this jumbophage, which is sort of growing and then it starts infecting uh, the bacterial cells, which so hops onto the membrane and it affects, basically it's injecting uh, the phage is injecting its DNA inside of the host cell. And when it injects the um, DNA inside the host cell, basically there is some particular phage protein, which we don't know yet, but it destroys the bacterial DNA and it incorporates all of its own protein inside the bacteria. And then it starts forming the shell-like structure um, in which it's enclosing all of its DNA. And then you're getting, uh, you have these capsids and, uh, you know, these things in yellow, these are like uh, uh, sort of phage tubulins or phage, uh, uh, like something similar to microtubules in eukaryotic cell. And these uh, capsids, they're basically uh, migrating, sort of, you know, they're trafficking on these uh, uh, bundles to go to the, uh, the phage shell, getting filled up with DNA, and then, you know, assembling tails inside the cytoplasm, forming all of these different uh, phage bouquets at later stages before being lysed out. Uh, yeah. What's the time scale? So this process happens, uh, you know, like uh, uh, the whole process of infection uh, takes about an hour or so. Yeah. Or one and a half hours, 90 minutes. Yeah, one and a half hours. Um, and recently uh, at UCSD, uh, they have uh, formed, I, I, I'm talk, I, I'll talk a little bit more about like a phage therapy center, but then uh, they are also now able to use this jumbo phage to treat uh, bacterial infection. So there was an uh, 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 infectious uh, sort of a pseudomonas. Uh, um, so the bacteria that I was working on, I didn't mention its name, but it's pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is a, a very deadly pathogen. And recently there was an outbreak uh, uh, of eye infection, uh, in which case the causative uh, bacteria was pseudomonas aeruginosa. And these jumbophages are active against uh, pseudom uh, pseudomonas aeruginosa. And um, they, uh, what they saw was that this particular phage, uh, you know, uh, was able to treat different eye infections. And uh, you can see these are different phages which they were testing, and they have very uh, fun names: PP Zapati, Good Vibes, PKZ. And the reason is that so uh, you know, like 
the the how these all these jumbophage or phage therapy paper that I talked about uh, before that mycobacterium infection, like they have been isolated by students actually. So there is a very famous uh, class. Uh, I don't know if it happens in Berkeley, but it happens in a lot of different institutions for undergraduates where the undergraduates, uh, it's called like the phage hunters class, it's by HGMI, so the undergraduates would just go out and they would collect, uh, the, you know, like phages against a mycobacterium or uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and then they would, you know, get to name their own phage. They also characterize these different phages bioinformatically, like what's the sequence, what are the different proteins. So it's a very interesting class for undergraduates. So that's where they get to name their phages. And uh, in the study, basically, they were able to show that some of the phages which were isolated by students and also like the jumbo phage, uh, uh, that we have been working on in the lab. It was able to treat these patients which had eye infections uh, due to pseudomonas aeruginosa. And um, I thought I would uh, recommend a book and I recommend also a person. Uh, so uh, so this is uh, Dr. Stephanie Stradi and she uh, is a professor at UCSD, UCSD School of Medicine and she's also co-director of the Center for Innovative Phage Applications and Therapeutics. So um, initially, or most of her life, she uh, has been an infectious disease epidemiologist, and she spent most of her career on HIV prevention um, research in uh, marginalized populations. But uh, in 2016, uh, her husband, um, who is uh, mentioned here, uh, Tom Patterson, uh, he got a deadly multidrug bacterial infection, uh, Essenitobacter bomani, which is again a very, uh, which is categorized as a superbug. And when everything else failed uh, on him, as a last resort, she started, uh, uh, she consulted with people to try phage therapy on him. Again, when it was not approved or anything, but it was just like a last, last resort technique and his husband was saved. Um, and after that, she had been actively uh, working to set up this uh, uh, iPad center at UCSD, and um, uh, which was actually the first phage therapy center in North America uh, as well uh, in 2016. And, uh, it, you know, which is assisting patients which have life-threatening superbug infections. And this is her book, The Perfect Predator, where she mentions about her uh, journey and, uh, you know, uh, her husband facing the, the uh, and how basically her husband was treated and everything with the doctor. So I uh, would definitely recommend uh, this uh, uh, amazing book. Um, yeah, and with that, I would like to thank everybody from my PhD labs, and also I didn't have a lot of time to talk about my current research, uh, hopefully sometime later, where I'm studying a different kind of a pathogen and a different kind of host. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, and I'll take any questions. Yeah. Um, that's so cool. So I guess I'm used to thinking of uh, membranes being composed of fossil yeah. Um, so how are the like how is trans how are these transported in and out of yeah, I, I didn't mention it. So, you know, like, even though this is a nucleus, it's very different from the eukaryotic nucleus in the sense that a eukaryotic nucleus is made up of membranes, versus in this case, this phage nucleus is made up of a single layer of protein and not a phospholipid membrane, as you rightly said. And how it is transporting things or not, we still don't know. And, uh, uh, you know, active research is going on uh, in my lab at UCSU regarding this. Um, what we think is that so um, there is uh, a, a professor at UCSD who has done some molecular dynamic simulation uh, based on the structure of this uh, you know shell like structure and as I mentioned it has a square lattice and uh, you know like we can measure like what is the size of the hole in these lattices so that size is around like 1.4 nanometer and at that uh, you know like you can have transport of maybe some metabolites or some uh, mRNA molecules to in and out of the cell but then how do you know like maybe big proteins uh, go in and out we don't know we, so we think that there might be some other proteins which are sort of helping maybe there are some like nuclear uh, you know export or import signals in the proteins which might be helping but uh, we haven't been able to find them yet so yeah that is a very active area of research right. yeah yeah there's a question on zoom are the phages eliminated from the body after treatment um no um uh, or at least we we don't know uh the thing is so you know like uh I, I don't know exactly how many rounds of like the application of pages like that particular patient went through, but like they didn't have an infection afterwards. And uh, generally, the idea is like if you have like one phage uh, 
for treatment, then it's possible that the bacteria might develop resistance to them. So generally, uh, you know, like a cocktail of phages is given, so three or four. So I am not sure like if they stay around or if they're eliminated, but maybe there is like a certain population because if the infection is not happening again, so there might be some certain population that lives behind. So if a bacteria comes up, they might suddenly just like grow up to eliminate that infection. But yeah, yeah, I'm not sure about that. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned, you, you described phage as a virus to the bacteria. Yeah. Uh, well, that, uh, does it really behave like virus to the bacteria? It is a virus. Yeah, okay. so like, uh, you know, like a virus needs a host to survive, these phages need bacteria to survive, oh. they cannot. And like the shape and like, the, you know, like the uh, sort of like the uh, homology to other uh, eukaryotic viruses, like, so everything is similar. So it is a virus. So yeah. this study can be applied to the previous talk too, and they will save them time to convert a year of study to... The moth, yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of a pathogen sort of uh, of the bacteria. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, it's a it's a fast... It's a model which can be studied on a faster scale, like evolutionary yeah, yeah. scale, because it, this happens, you know, in one and a half hours yeah. or something like the evolution per se. So this is like, yeah, so many people are studying like evolution of phages and, you know, like what are the host defense mechanisms? Then there are these counter defense mechanisms in phages. So there is this evolutionary arms race sort of going on between phages and bacteria, which is a very hot topic of research as well. Yeah. And, and the phages, well, phages attack eukary eukaryal so, so far, we don't know, and we don't think that is happening. They're very specific to bacteria, although like in our body, like in the gut microbiome per se, we, we do have phages, we, uh, you know, like, uh, but they may be very specific for bacteria, uh, and they haven't been found to like get inside mammalian cells on their own. So like in case of bacteria, they need a receptor on the bacteria to get into the bacterial cell, but by themselves, like phages cannot get inside a mammalian cell to replicate. So um, they're very specific for bacteria. And when you deliver the phages to the patients, you have to kind of go to the, uh, the well bacteria side. So it, it really depends on infection to infection. Like in the case of the patient that I showed, so just like swab application was fine. But in some cases, you might have to give them like intravenously. So um, it, it depends a lot from where the infection is, what kind of infection it is, and yeah, and whether it can go through the yeah, bloodstream or how. Very cool talk. Um, this might be a very important question. Um, so superbugs are really deadly because they are risks to antibiotics. Yeah. What about like so on that line of thought? Could there be like phage resistant bacteria? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, because you know, like the evolution is happening on a very fast time scale. So like bacteria have defense mechanisms against phages, phages have defense mechanism against viruses. So um, yeah, like if you just administer like one phage, let's say to a patient, uh, they can develop resistant. So that's why uh, uh, it's very difficult to like, uh, you know, like genetically manipulate phages. We don't have a lot of good genetic techniques yet, but that is also a very active area of research where maybe you can make phages that are uh, you know, like not resistant to bacteria, or the other thing is you can give like phages in a cocktail, so like many, many phages together, uh, so that uh, they don't develop, like all of them don't develop resistant to the bacteria or the superbug at once. So that is also something which is uh, being looked upon. But yeah, phages can develop resistant for sure. Yeah. Yeah. We have another Zoom question. Yes. Uh, how long does it take to prepare an image, prepare and image a specimen of CET? Uh, very long. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I think like um, it's 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 a multi-day effort. So uh, like if everything is working fine, because I, as I mentioned, it's a million-dollar microscope. So like half of the time it's not even working. But when it works, uh, uh, maybe one day to make the sample. Then you have uh, one day of doing the fib milling of the specimen, and then the third day of making uh, of taking like the uh, TEM images, like the three-dimensional images that I mentioned, and then you can spend however many months on analyzing the data. Uh, but And this isn't an ideal scenario if everything is working, but if everything is not working, this one day can become however many days, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, just a question about the cryo electron microscopy. Yeah. So the reason you have, to, you have to thin out the cells, is it literally just because they're at a thickness where you're not passing electrons to the sample anymore? And you have to get yeah, 
So like, uh, you know, like the mean free path of electrons inside uh, the transmission electron microscope is in the order of 300 to 400 nanometers. So anything which is thicker than 300, 400 nanometers, so like even the bacteria are like one micron or thousand nanometers or so. So anything which is, so if the electrons are going through, so after 300, they're gonna just scatter inside of the specimen. So if they're just scattering inside the specimen, they can like damage, like radiation damage can occur to the specimen, or uh, these electrons are basically not collected by the detector. Uh, to give a good image. So that's why we need to thin uh, these specimens so that we can get them in a range where electrons can just pass through the specimen rather than scattering uh, elsewhere. Are you allowed to change the parameters of the energy of the electrons or the electron beam to tinker with that at all? Uh, or are you pretty limited to your... We're kind of pretty limited because like there is the standard voltage of the microscope. So, you know, everything is kind of limited by that, yeah. There's one more question yes. on Zoom, I think actually for Signe, ah. um, that just popped up. Uh, I heard recently that global warming may be increasing the virulence of pathogenetic, fu pathogenetic fungi. Generally, they did not evolve to thrive at body temperature. Is this only a hypothesis? Oh, God. Um, okay, did fungus evolve? Wait, can you read the last part? Uh, so generally fungi did not evolve to thrive at body temperature. Is this only a hypothesis that they're becoming more virulent with global warming? Uh, so there are a couple of assumptions in that question. Let me, I'm just thinking this out loud. So fungus, uh, I think we're assuming human body temperature. Uh, I think so, yes. And fungal pathogens. I, I mean, I, again, like everything is so context dependent. If, if there was a particular example, which maybe the question asker knows, um, then I could think a little bit more about how that could have been. I mean, I'm, I'm certain that somewhere in the world that probably is true <laughs> um, with some type of post-parasite interaction with fungus. And I mean, it, yeah, in general, climate change definitely has changed Post range, right? So we think about um, mosquitoes, for example, and mosquitoes are, you know, going farther north and south than they used to, uh, depending on, you know, where in the country you are, which has expanded the range of malaria or other mosquito borne diseases, for example. Um, fungal pathogens, maybe, I know that they're, if we're thinking about um, amphibians. Citrid is a huge fungal pathogen that's worldwide that I think has also increased with global temperature. Um, but amphibian body temperature is a little bit different than human body temperature. Um, so, I mean, I'm sure you could also find examples where the opposite is true. So, I, I wouldn't say, I would say it's still like a hypothesis, <laughs> maybe not a theory, maybe not law. Um, that's interesting, though. I, I'll have to think more about that. I don't know it's a decent enough answer. I, yeah, I don't know. Do you have any follow-ups or still there? Joseph, let us let us know. But, 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 but like on, on Earth, you do have like uh, different climates yeah. with different year-long like temperatures. That kind of answer could be there already just by studying different parts of the Earth. Yeah. Kind of. Right. I'm not sure if they, that. Right. I guess in the other part of climate change is people typically think of it as global warming, but it's not always that. So you can have moisture increasing moisture in certain areas, which could potentially lead to greater fungal pathogens. Um, so again, I think I, I think a lot of that is very context dependent, but certainly climate change is a huge driver in infectious disease spread worldwide in, in wildlife and in humans. If you're um, if you're an amphibian or insect as well, on that note, what climate change will do is if it's warmer, then it'll speed up, kind of it, it'll it'll make the the host itself a little bit of a better place for the pathogen to exist, and it might then impact like the metabolism of the insect or amphibian or other cold-blooded animal yeah. such that it's easier to participate in. Right. So my example with the, the yeah. fungus, the, the, the or opio cordyceps, probably has a slightly different answer than a human fungal pathogen. Exactly. 
Yeah. Do I have one more question? Yeah. So uh, is faith usually found on nature? Can, uh, are we trying to make uh, humans trying to manufacture any kind, create any? So like pages are naturally found, soil, water, everywhere, like your hands and body everywhere. So pages are naturally found, but like yeah, for therapeutic applications, um, generally like, yeah, so there are industries now which are setting up all these big fermentation reactions because you can only isolate them from bacteria. So like maybe you have found a particular phage, which is again, uh, you, infect which infects a particular kind of bacteria but then you need to get more of the phage you will need to grow all these big bacteria in fermentation reaction infect them isolate the phages from them so uh yeah for isolation you can do this in the factory or in the lab or however the setting is but like to test them like they're just found in nature that's how people are isolating yeah there must be some group trying to create some definitely so yeah the, uh the you know like they're definitely trying to do like good like using crispr cas to you know genetically oh. engineer phages as well uh in the sense like i i'm not sure if you can create it like from scratch but maybe you've isolated something and then you know like oh this particular gene it makes it not so infective but we can try to increase the infectivity by manipulating this gene so those kind of efforts are ongoing yeah All righty then. I think with that, let's thank both of our speakers one more time. Thank you.